G'day and welcome to this month's Redback Business Skills Show. I'm your host, Daniel Kim, and it's great to have your company once again. Now, for the first time in many years, we are coming to you live in a remote format today, hence the headsets. And this is all against this, uh, the backdrop of social distancing and restrictions around travel. Isn't it great that we happen to be a conferencing company as well as a streaming company because the show must go on. Now on the program today, we are exploring the importance of customer feedback and joining me live via video link to help us understand why customer feedback is critical at a time like this is the CEO of Jago, Terry Wiley. Terry, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, it's great to have you with us. Isn't it weird that we're doing these um, video link-ups and everything? It's, it's a sign of the times that we're living in. Sure is. And as you say, good, good job that you're in that business. Yes, absolutely. Very thankful, actually. Um, it's not the easiest of times for people. Now, customer feedback has always been a staple in business, but it's absolutely essential in times as uncertain as these. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, challenging times at this, uh, at this point. So... You know, customer feedback in, in many ways can play a more important role for businesses during this time of change. So it's a, it's a timely, uh, for me personally, I think it's a very timely subject to have. Yeah. Now, customer feedback is also a bit of a broad area. So can you tell us a bit about what we're going to focus on today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you're right. I mean, what it may sound a bit obvious in terms of what customer feedback is. Uh, and, and quite often, customer feedback is part of a a program, you know, a customer feedback or customer experience program. Um, and, and having a method in which to gather and collate customer feedback is, is quite often part of that program and, and a very critical, important part of it. So we're going to focus a bit more on that today in terms of what we need to look out for, you know, why we need to do it, and, and obviously give some sort of case studies on that sort of stuff as well. But, you know, right now I'm conscious that there's – different people on the call from different businesses and, and different life cycles in terms of their customer experience programs. Um, so we're going to keep it fairly generic, but obviously there's an opportunity to ask me questions later on. Um, but right now, as an example, you know, people may be, um, may be asking for feedback through a web-based form. They may have a tool in place already that they're looking to improve. And in some cases, they may not be doing anything at all or just relying on the customer contact them with feedback. So we're going to look at other ways, uh, better ways, in my opinion, in terms of getting that feedback to make a difference to the business. That's excellent. That, clearly lots to unpack there. And just to put it out there and be really transparent with everyone, this is not a sales exercise. I mean, Terry is the CEO of a customer feedback kind of company, but the point of today isn't to talk about how good his company is, et cetera, et cetera. We're talking about how businesses and organizations need to be able to incorporate feedback in an ongoing manner to help them navigate a time when nobody knows what's going on really and things are changing by the minute almost. So that's just out there for everybody's clarification. Clearly lots to unpack today, Terry really looking forward to it and of course don't forget you can join our conversation today by clicking the dark blue hand icon at the top of your screen and get a question in normally if we were in the studio i'd have like a little ipad here where your questions come through i'm in a little uh, meeting studio room set up here so you know you've got the little headset i've got a little laptop here and i've second screen so during q a you'll see me turn away from the camera to read your questions coming through it's not because i'm ignoring you it's because i'm actually reading through your questions so again it's that dark blue hand icon at the top the light blue icon of course is the resources button if you'd like to download a couple of documents before you go but terry i reckon we can get straight into this um let's talk a bit about customer feedback because you know there are a few different types um, of forms and feedback survey tools out there and customer feedback can sound a bit obvious, but you know, in your experience, is it obvious and what exactly is feedback? Yeah, um, it, it probably does sound obvious. And as I mentioned earlier on, you know, it, it's, it's just a process of, of obtaining feedback from our customers. And um, like most things, there is, there's customer feedback and there's customer feedback. So it's about how we do it and how we execute and, and then deal with that information um, so it benefits the business in different ways. And, and, and you're right, Daniel. I mean, there's lots of different platforms out there and different survey methods or methodologies. Um, yeah, and I'd like to explore those a little bit just, just sort of quickly because, um, you know, we get asked this question a lot in, in terms of what measures should we have in place. 
Uh, and, and there's different uh, survey types and methods. You know, there's um, what we call CSAT, so which is short for customer satisfaction, normally a one to five scale. We have net promoter score or NPS as it's commonly known, which is a, an 11 point scale ranging from zero to 10. Um, some people use graphics, so it's, you know, uh, sad faces, happy faces, uh, and in some cases it could just be stars, so kind of a review style mechanism where we've got five stars. Um, it, it, the important thing is to not necessarily get hooked up on what that scale is, that kind of methodology. Uh, the, the, um, the critical thing is having a measure in place. So whether you choose NPS or, or a different rating scale, it's just about ensuring that you can measure your performance over time and then benchmark yourself against that. Um, but personally, I am a fan of net promoter score. It is a, a global standard, I guess. You know, a lot of enterprises use that globally, around about 90, 95% do. Um, it's used because it's, it's simple. Uh, I know that sounds a bit, bit, bit probably, you know, derogatory to NPS. It's, but the, the beauty is in its simplicity, um, and and I like the fact that we can actually have a, a slightly more granular scale that we can measure our performance a little bit better. So, for instance, what I mean by that is if we've got a a one to five rating scale, I could be stuck on three for quite a bit, but if I'm using a greater, more granular scale like Net Promoter Score you know, uh, that could be the difference between moving from five to six or six to seven. So I can actually see some improvement in that rating scale where I might be stuck on a, a, a lower rating as in a, a one to five scale. So I quite like that granularity, but don't get too hung up on the actual scale itself, the measure. It's just important that you've got a measure in place. Great. Let's talk about the delivery methods because a lot of uh, feedback surveys that I've been on have been web pages and email invitations, but I've heard recently there have been some SMS invites. Yeah, lot, lots of different ways to, to ask your customers for feedback. And, but part of that depends on your business. Um, if you're lucky enough to have email addresses or phone numbers of your customers, then that's fantastic. You've got an advantage. But some businesses don't, you know, hairdressers or um, uh, you know, walk-in trades, or retailers, et cetera, is a really good example where they don't always have contact information for their customers. So there's different methods to do that. You know, that could be, uh, we've seen that printing on receipts, uh, QR codes, and QR codes is a common one in fast food restaurants now, for instance, and it works pretty well. Uh, some organizations have apps, uh, so we can have in-app notifications. Uh, we can have Wi-Fi intercepts. So if we're in a restaurant or a cafe or a, or a lounge, an airport lounge, for instance, we can, where we're, we're, uh, we've got Wi-Fi services, we can actually intercept that Wi-Fi service with a feedback survey as well. So lots of different methods. The common ones, of course, are email and SMS. Uh, and for good reason, you know, you, we get a good result from those. There's a couple of critical differences between email and SMS, and I'd just like to share those with you. Um, but benefits and, and disadvantages in some cases to both. The, um, the advantage of email is that it's free, um, uh, which, is, which is great, of course. And that, in, in many cases, uh, is, is a single justification for using email. Uh, SMS, there is a cost, but we actually do see an improved response rate when using SMS. Uh, normally around about a 5% improvement when sending emails, or, sorry, sending feedback requests via SMS versus email. The, the slight downside with SMS is that we find that responses are a little bit more brief than those via email, uh, where a lot of people are using a keyboard. So, um, you know, there is some trade-offs in terms of the amount of insight you can get via email versus SMS, uh, but an improved response rate with SMS as well. Yeah. Um, but I would, just to add to that, actually, an important thing, and it comes back to the previous question about the, the survey uh, method and, and uh, uh, the approach and also design. Mm -hmm. What is really critical is whether you're doing it via SMS or email, the, the critical thing is to ensure that the actual survey design is device agnostic. Uh, it has to be mobile friendly. 
we're seeing now that on average across all the industries, all respondent demographic types, around about 70% of surveys are being completed via a mobile device. And that's via right. email as well. So that's right. not just SMS, that's, that's email. So really critical that it's uh, device, device agnostic. And also the design of the survey is really important. Make sure it's clean. Make sure it's obvious what you're asking them. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but too many people now are trying to get too fancy and incorporate too much branding and imagery within a survey template or a survey request, be it email, et cetera. Quite often the message and the link can get lost within all that's going on and the busyness. So keep it simple, absolutely get it on brand, incorporate uh, some color and, and your logo, but keep it quite plain and simple. That's really important for ensuring you get maximum response rate. So many little nuggets of tips you've thrown out um, just in that last five minute segment, Terry. A couple of things I wanted to touch on. 70% um, in terms of emails being opened on phones, or actually survey responses altogether being um, been submitted via a mobile device. That's that's indicative of a big shift in our device usage preferences. And also, I'm assuming this is going to only keep in increasing now that everybody's working from home and away from the office. Absolutely right. Yeah, look, this is just a trend that's, that's going up uh, and it will continue to grow up. Uh, um, and, and we'll touch a bit later on in, in, um, in terms of some of the other aspects of, of considering mobile and SMS as well. But it's, uh, it's absolutely vital for anyone to get a high volume of, of feedback, which then feeds a lot of the benefits into the business. So it's a really important consideration. Yeah, and on the note of SMS, um, anybody in uh, this thought just popped up while you were talking about the different channels. Anybody in communications will tell you different channels serve different purposes, and you're talking about getting different results depending on what channels you are using. So I suppose that would also lend itself into thinking about what tone is appropriate for what channel and the kind of questions you are asking. Yeah, so it's a really good point, actually. And, and, and coming back to the kind of design of the surveys, the tone is very similar. Uh, stuff to avoid, uh, yeah, apart from messy designs and lots of graphics, lots of copy. Um, and, and copy using different language. And I don't mean different language in, in the sense of a different language. I, I just keep it simple. Keep it everyday language, everyday speak. Um, which is terrible language, but you know that's a reality. <laughs> and also ensure that you, ensure that we're not using uh, templates because we've seen a lot of tools that are being used um, by companies that, that come from overseas, uh, and quite often they may have fairly standard templates in. So you know U.S. spelling, for instance, and and it's clearly not localized or personalized enough. So the tone is really important to to keep people engaged. Clearly, make sure it's personalised. It's an easy thing to do, yes. uh, because all yes. that has an impact on your, your likelihood to improve your response rate and keep your customer engaged. I'm a stickler for spelling and grammar, and it really, really peeves me when I see a little Z at like the American spelling on a lot of official communication channels. Now, prior to today, Terry, I haven't actually been thinking about customer feedback as a communications exercise, but just in the last 10 minutes, you've changed my thoughts completely. It's it's 100% a communications exercise. Um, timing is a big part of getting communications right. How would you, or what are your thoughts on timing in terms of feedback when you get it how, when you respond and how you respond? Yeah, um, a simple answer to that, as soon as physically possible. Um, so, you know, that may not be uh, practical for some types of businesses in, in some sectors, but where possible, we like to, to connect to system, oh, sorry, not us, but you know, what you should be doing is, is connecting to backend systems that can effectively and automatically trigger the process of, of asking your customer for feedback. So to, as an example, you know, if I, um, if I go into a retail store, I might be a Maya One member, for instance, I make a purchase, my card is scanned, and then almost immediately, and then there's some delays on this, but you know, when I would say immediately, within the hour ideally, uh, a, a feedback request is automatically pinged. And hence, this is driving some of that mobile activity as well in terms of uh. people's 
desire to improve the, the timeliness of getting feedback uh, is, is also driving some of that mobile activity. But we see that response rates drop dramatically every 24 hours after the transaction or interaction with the business. So every day we leave it, response rates decline. Uh, and again, it comes back to the, the higher response rate, the more data, the more value in that information. And we'll talk a little bit about the importance of customer recovery as well. So the quicker I can find out that a customer is unhappy after a transaction or interaction with my business, the more likely, uh, sorry, the more likelihood I've got to be able to deal with that problem in a timely manner, recover that customer, and prevent social and word of mouth damage. So uh, yes. timeliness is really important when when thinking about surveying customers. Uh, a, a number of people are batch sending feedback requests out. Now that's okay if it's a daily or, or every other day, but if you're thinking about doing that in you know weekly, fortnightly, monthly, it's too late. Mm. Um, I appreciate in some cases you may not have a choice in it, but there's plenty of options around connectivity to CRMs or databases, accounting systems that can automate that process and do that triggering for you. It's a really important part of uh, and a, an important consideration in any customer feedback process. I suppose on top of that, once you've gotten that feedback on time, the worst thing you can do is not act on it. So get that, ask for the feedback in time as soon as well, physically possible, like you mentioned. Once you've got that, don't ignore it. That's probably going beyond the scope of today's conversation. But um, just back to the point about the um, as physically soon as possible, uh, a lot of companies I know have um, gotten some automation in there and they're able to like get these triggered as soon as possible. You, you gave the example of going to a retail store, making a purchase and getting a feedback request within the hour. What are your thoughts on um, those automated systems where they can get it instantaneously? Well, that, that's that's works really well. Um, and again, it's that in the moment, capturing the customer in the moment. And there's there's different examples of that. And, and you know, um, being in a restaurant and having a feedback card on the table where you can, you, you can type in a URL or, or scan a QR code is a great example of, of getting a customer in the moment. And, and you're right, Daniel, in terms of is how you deal with that as well. And being able to deal with a customer problem almost in the moment too is is a fantastic way of doing it, um, and just you know even on even on um, cases where it's a little bit more difficult. Well, retail is a really good example where completely understand that a lot of retailers will have a transaction with a customer and 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 have no idea who that customer is, and then potentially no idea whether that experience was, was positive or not. It's really easy to do. Most POS systems allow the capture of email addresses or phone numbers. Uh, a perfect example is JB Hi-Fi and uh, you know the way they do it these days. So they ask for mobile numbers for every customer and they SMS a, a, a receipt to every customer now. It's All a really right. simple process. Um, and, and their excuse for doing it to the customer is quite often that those printed receipts, you know, they actually wear and they fade. So when you're keeping a receipt uh, as as proof of purchase and for warranty purposes, quite often that becomes a bit tricky in six months when your receipt's completely faded. You can't prove the, uh, the purchase. So their excuse is, we now text that to you and you've got it for life. Brilliant, you know, really simple, but it builds a customer database it allows future marketing, but also importantly, it allows for the ability to do things like get customer feedback in a, in a very timely manner. So that kind of in the moment thing is, is a great way of doing it. That is good thinking. Now, is there a risk that people would say, oh, hang on a second, I've got this instantaneous request for feedback. Clearly it's automated and clearly it's not for me because we were talking about the whole personalized questioning before. Is there a risk there? No, not really. As long as it's personalized, um, uh, you've, you've got someone's name, you know, obviously it's a simple process to personalize the SMS or the email that's going out. Um, again, the language used is really important just, just to 
explain why we're doing it and, or, 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 you know, the actions we're going to take on it. And we talk a little bit more about closing the loop later on and uh, because it's the end of the process is really important as well. Uh, but we we never see a reduction in response rates or participation rates based on somebody getting something instantly or very soon after an event. It, it has the opposite impact. It goes up. All right. Okay. Well, this is what you were saying before, right? As time goes by, response rates go down. I must, be, I must just be the um, the only weirdo out here because for me, I'd think like, well, hang on a second. This is automated. It wasn't for me. Uh, it's probably just me being an idiot. Um, but so we talked about getting the channel right, getting the tone right, and getting it done on time. Um, what other factors influence response rates? And can Is there something businesses can do to increase those response rates? Yeah, so it's so all those things we've just mentioned, but also incentivize respondents or customers to, to leave feedback. Uh, be surprised how uh, effective that is, uh, or can be, I should say. Not all incentives work, and, and we have to be mindful about that. Um, uh, as an example, and we had this very conversation with someone recently, actually, it was a, a chain of cafes uh, that specialize in coffee. And they wanted to incentivize customers with free coffee if they gave feedback. Great idea, of course, you know, makes complete sense. Uh, relating the incentive to our product is, is a good way of, of dealing with that. And of course, the cost is lower as well. The challenge with that is that if I had the coffee and actually I didn't like it and my feedback was negative, the last thing I want is a free coffee. So there's considerations <laughs> around what incentives to offer. Uh, need to be mindful of that, actually. So I know it sounds a bit ridiculous, but it's actually quite true. Um, so monetary incentives is always a great idea, prize draw type stuff. Um, you know, people love a cash incentive. Uh, uh, and certainly the amount makes a bit of a difference, but it really drives response rates. We see upward of 20%, in some cases, more improvement in response rates if there's a, an incentive attached to it. And, and please don't, don't um, misunderstand me here. There's a big difference between offering incentive for a positive response yeah, yes. versus an incentive for all responses. So, you know, the former being elite, um, so definitely do not do that, but offer uh, an incentive for everyone that responds and a prize yeah. draw entry or something like that works really, really well. Right. So it's probably some of those things that make a whole lot of sense in hindsight, but when you're just in the rush of getting through your business, you might not give a lot of thought to it. Can I just say, I've got a little pop-up on my screen that says my laptop battery is running low and I haven't plugged it in. Can I get you to talk about the next bit, which is the transactional versus relational feedback? I've got to go and get a little power plug. I probably won't be able to ask you any meaningful questions about this particular topic, but I'll leave you with the audience for about five minutes, please. Not a problem. Hopefully it doesn't die in the meantime. But yeah, the, the transactional versus relational feedback is, is actually quite an interesting one. And um, uh, transactional is probably quite obvious again. And using a retail example uh, where somebody goes into store, um, uh, purchases something and, and gets a feedback request after that. So it's very transactional, kind of a one-off contact with the company and the customer. Uh, what, what we're seeing more and more of, and, and, and it is quite important in some industries, and to give examples of industries where this is relevant, uh, home builders, real estate, mortgage brokers are, are three good examples. And, and to give you uh, uh, a relevant uh, case study, I guess, in terms of how we can deploy and have a relational feedback um, program in place is, is home builders, where there's... A, a, quite a lengthy time between the, the moment a customer signs a contract and you know takes ownership of the building. And in fact, the contact doesn't stop there. It goes beyond that because most builders have what we call a maintenance period, which is two to three months after build. So there could be six months elapsed between the time a customer deals with us versus the time they they stop dealing with us. The biggest mistake in that example is to ask for customer feedback at the end of that build process. Because the reality is, is if a customer's had a bad experience and they're upset, 
is sometime during that build process. So it's really important to implement a relational program where we're touching base with the customer on a regular, on a regular basis through that build process. Uh, that allows us to identify as a company where there could be weaknesses and things falling down in that process that we can then obviously change and improve on. But importantly, we can we can understand the customers. Um, sorry, when the customer is unhappy, and deal with that in a more timely manner, because the last thing we want is is a customer becoming unhappy after a month, telling the world about their bad experience before we as a company or as a brand get to know that and and have the ability to deal with it. So, having a, a relational system in place work really well depending upon the industry that you're in and the relationship you have with the customer. All right. And that billing example is sort of similar to your coffee example from before, right? I mean, if you get it wrong, asking for feedback or giving the wrong incentive can feel like a bit of a slap in the face to the customer. Mm. Okay. Spot on. <laughs> Absolutely right. Not a risk you want to be running. Um, I don't quite understand what you mean by the last dot point we've got on the slide here. Closing the loop. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, cl closing the loop, and, and you, you kind of mentioned this earlier on in, in that it's not just about getting feedback, but how we deal with it, and that's really important. And there's a couple of different options here, and, and something that's really easy and often overlooked is responding to customers uh, after they've provided feedback. If we ask customers to give us some time to provide us with ratings and, and, and you know, textual comments around their experience with us as a brand, there's nothing more frustrating for a customer just to be left on a landing page that says, thank you very much for your feedback. Agreed. We have no idea whether you as a company or us as a company uh, are doing anything about it, care, um, especially if my comments and my experience has been negative. Mm. So it's a, it's a relatively easy process and again, can be completely automated, but can be made to look very personal and authentic. A simple automated email that's sent out after that process uh, doesn't have to be immediately because clearly that's automated, but built in delays where an email is sent to the customer with a different response depending upon the rating that they've given, uh, which is a simple thank you very much. You know, we really appreciate your business and, and your feedback and, you know, whatever message it is you want, down to, you know, really appreciate your business. Thank you for your feedback. We apologize that things didn't go as, as we would expect. You know, we will contact you in the next 24 hours to deal with it. Lots of different ways of responding to the customer and importantly, keeping them engaged and making them feel that you care. It's really, really important and not something to be overlooked. Too many programs, customer experience programs, fail in this point, as well as then taking action and dealing with a customer complaint. Also very important. Gotcha. So that's what we call by closing the loop closing the loop. So acknowledging the responses you've been given and then also taking the appropriate action at the right time and letting the customers know that this is being worked on. Yeah, absolutely. Because also just to give you a, a stat on that, um, around about 50% of customers or respondents do not believe that their feedback goes to anybody that can actually make a difference. You know what? I actually feel that way about some of my... Um, service providers like my telco or my internet company, I just feel like I'm just a figure to them. I'm just one of the millions of people they serve. And I don't know if my particular comment means anything to them. Yeah, you're right. Well, I, well, well I think in that particular case, so, so you, you're absolutely right. So if you're dealing with a bank or a telco that has you know millions of customers in some cases, I understand that it can be quite difficult for them to deal with individual cases and they're using the feedback as an aggregated response to understand, you know, to kind of get a gauge on, on customer ex, uh, experience and, and, and where things are, are failing. Uh. But in most businesses, in 90% of businesses, we're not that big. And we do have the ability to deal with individual customer issues. And if you can, 
you should. And we'll get onto that in a bit as well in terms of why you should. But it really is important. It can have a major impact on your business, both negatively and positively, depending on how you deal with it. Yes, you're right. Well, why don't we talk about that now? Normally, we'd sort of start with the why and then zoom into the how. But we flipped on. We flipped the program on its head today. We've started with the techniques and the hows and what you need to get involved. But let's zoom out for a second and think about the bigger picture. You know, why do we need customer feedback? Yeah, um, the, the reality is we have choices uh, as as customers, whether we're B two B customers or B two C customers. Um, if we're looking for a you know, an IT company to fix our, our computing equipment in the office or uh, accountants or lawyers or marketing agencies, or if we're a consumer looking to, to, to you know, get our car fixed or our haircut or, or a plumber to come to our house, we have untold choices about where we can get our services and our products from. The reality is most of these people do pretty much the same thing. A plumber does the same thing. Their pricing is pretty much the same. We now make decisions based on the service levels we receive, the experience we have with companies. It's really important to know how we service our customers and the experience they have. And again, we'll come on to this in a moment in terms of you know, voice of the customer, uh, the word of mouth importance, the online reviews and social media. Uh, the, the, the issue is, is that customers, as customers, we do not complain. Uh, we actually just vote with our feet. We have a bad experience, we go somewhere else next time. We don't bother complaining on the whole. 86% of consumers do not complain, they just go elsewhere. So we do have a bit of an attitude here in Australia, especially where, you know, she'll be right, uh, or, or customers, uh, my customers are happy because they're not complaining. We just don't know they're unhappy. Um, so it's really important to proactively seek customer feedback and not rely on people coming to you. So that's why we need a customer feedback or one of the key reasons why we need a feedback program in place. That's a really good point. And I think for the first time today, I'm feeling like part of the majority here because I definitely identify with that 86%. I don't, it's and it's similar to what I was just talking about a, a minute ago, but I don't feel like my feedback would count for much, at least for the big companies that have millions of customers. So again, I'll just vote with my feet. Um, one question I've got um, relating to the current coronavirus situation and how everything is changing and businesses, organizations, government departments, individuals, we're all moving into a time where things are uncertain and there's so much change afoot. Normally we talk about the importance of customer feedback in terms of being able to provide insights for business direction or for organizational decision making. Um, what What's your take on this whole situation in that neither customers nor the business really know what's happening and it's uncharted waters for everybody? Yeah, it's it's a really good question, of course. And, and you know, we're all kind of learning through this process. And, and we'll talk a little bit about some case studies later on, specifically around what these uh, challenges we're facing today can mean to, to our program. Um, and uh, I mean, in fact, I can address those now, Daniel, if, you, if you'd like me to. But yeah, you sure. know, I think the importance with with customer feedback is that, yeah, quite often it's these kind of relational or transactional things. And, and our business is fairly stable in, in terms of we do the same thing every day, day in, day out. Um, today, that's different. Uh, and, you know, as businesses, we're all having to change and adapt. Um, and there's there's some really good case studies that I can share that, that we know of where the business has had to adapt its customer feedback program accordingly and 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 why it's so important. And I think there's some, you know, even if, if you think about Redback, obviously, you know, the organization that you work for and that's putting on this event today is a great example of that where um, a very good business, very happy customers, uh, you know, you, you you proactively seek feedback from customers. But in the time of COVID-19, you're one of the very fortunate companies that's, that's experienced unprecedented growth. Now, that is a great position to be in and in a lot better position than many organizations right now. But clearly, that comes with significant challenges. And 
hopefully you won't mind me sharing no, no. those. But no, you know, no, come, come, coming with significant growth means that you're not equipped properly in terms of manpower or, or person power, uh, you know, technology constraints and, and really stretching the business to a limit in a number of different ways. So mm-hmm. ensuring that you're continually getting customer feedback is critical at this point in time uh, because, yeah, great, the financials may be looking very, very positive, but that could be a short-lived uh, experience if the customers are finding it difficult because they're not getting the level of service or there's technology you know, issues with their, their conference and video calls. So it's really, really important for you to be more proactive in, in that process. Um, I am conscious of time, but you know, another great example is retail. So a lot of retail stores are closing now but a lot of moving their business to more online focus, of course, you know, contactless um, delivery. Challenges with that, you know, the online experience is nowhere near as exciting and and interactive uh, for customers. But some of the other challenges are um, uh, now some of that process is out of our control. We're relying on third party logistics companies, for instance, you know, we're, we're using uh, food delivery companies for restaurants, and there's issues around who's responsible for late delivery, the food's arriving cold, you know, is it the restaurant, is it the, the delivery organization? So, so where things start to get a little bit out of your control, it's even more important to, to continue feedback and ask things in a different way and maybe adapt your questions somewhat differently. Um, and the third example that I wanted to share, which is another great example, is gymnasiums. So the fitness industry generally is struggling, of course, and government legislation has, has meant they've had to close their doors. Um, but for some gymnasiums, they've adapted very quickly and very cleverly in that they're doing things a bit differently. So they're now live streaming classes. They're doing you know, online uh, personal training. They're having to communicate with their members in a very different way. Again, not ideal for a lot of their members who are paying a lot of money for these memberships every month. But it's really important for the gymnasiums in this case to ensure that they're continually checking in with their customers to make sure this is actually fulfilling their needs and that their experience is positive. Because again, you know, if it's not, they'll just end up cancelling their membership and that has a massive financial impact on businesses. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily about, uh, you know, certainly in most cases, absolutely not stopping the program at all, uh, but adapting it to the changing times and making sure you're covering different parts of the business, uh, which you might not have been doing before. So hopefully that gives some examples of how, you know, feedback is really important in, in these challenging times. Yeah, absolutely. So the takeaway there is to take your customers with you on this unknown journey. That's the main. Key. That's the takeaway that I'm hearing from you on this one. That's absolutely that's really good. Right. Okay, so we've got about five minutes left on the program. So being conscious of time, let's go to Q and A. We've got a couple of questions that are coming through, and of course, a quick reminder for everybody who's joining us online. Please, you can join the conversation, ask a question to Terry. It's the dark blue hand icon at the top of your screen and get it submitted and it'll come through on this secondary screen I've got. First question comes from Jerry. And Jerry's asking, how do you deal with negative customer feedback? Um, re- really good question, Jerry. And um, yeah, it, it, every company is a little bit different in, in this, of course, and their abilities to do it. You know, from from someone that is in the industry, it's easy for me to say that you should be dealing with with negative customer feedback and and not just sweeping it under the carpet, of course. Um, And it does come down to the fact that uh, negative feedback isn't just going to affect that one customer in terms of their likelihood to to use the company again, is that we know that uh, on average, one unhappy customer tells 15 other people. Uh, about their negative experience, uh, whether they're telling people in, you know, friends and family through word of mouth or jumping onto online review platforms and social media platforms. Uh, but but dealing with the customer feedback, uh, negative customer feedback, uh, to bring that customer back in line and the repeat customer again is is actually really important. And, and let me try and put that into some quantitative figures. Uh, on average, we see that 
that companies on the whole have around about 20% of unhappy customers. That's on average. Every industry is different, of course. So if, if we can recover and make a quarter of those people happy again, just multiply that. So to multiply your number of customers, let's say 20% of those unhappy, we're going to recover 5%, which is a very conservative number, by the way. And, you know, you should be looking for more. But just multiply that amount. So your average sale price by the 5% of customers that you can recover. And on the whole, that normally means quite a large amount of money. So, you know, just responding to those and dealing with those in a timely manner may absolutely create more work, may absolutely incur some more costs internally in terms of having the personnel to do that, but it will, on the whole, pay for itself many times over. And that's just in terms of recovery of customers, not the impact, the positive impact it has on online reviews and word of mouth, because that customer is more likely to use you again, more likely to pay more for your service, more likely to leave a positive review, which, by the way, in terms of monetary value, a one-star improvement in online ratings represents between 5 to 10% revenue improvement. So significant numbers if we're dealing with customer feedback properly. Makes perfect business sense to me, actually. Thank you for that question, Jerry. A really good one. The next question comes from Mike, and Mike is asking, how do you combat feedback fatigue? <laughs> really good question as, as well, Mike. And, I, and, and, you know, it is important to not to over-survey your customers. Um, the incentive helps with that, by the way, and we talked a little bit about that earlier on, of course. So incentivizing people to, to respond. Nothing frustrates me more than, and, and, you know, I hate using brands. I, in fact, I won't even mention the brand, but, you know, I, I fly a little bit. I'm Queensland based and I fly quite, quite a bit. Um, and there's a particular airline I use quite often where I get a survey every time I fly. Uh, now, that might be twice a day or, or once every two days or, or whatever it might be. But um, uh, there's nothing more frustrating than getting a 20-minute feedback survey, uh, you know, twice a day or, or every other day. It's infuriating. So there are controls that, that are in place um, that, that, that prevent that happening. So exclusion periods, as, as we call it, you know, only provide – people one survey a month for instance uh, depending on the industry you're in make sure you incentivize them keep it really short and engaging that prevents survey fatigue yeah 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 i'm just thinking i'm getting fatigued thinking about that situation that you were in i would not like that to happen to me at all thank you for that question mike probably got time for one last question this one's from mitchell we have a customer feedback program but we've been asked to review costs in this climate how can i convince management to keep it that's a good one yeah it's a, it's a very good question and, and sort of touched on this a little bit earlier on um, uh, completely understand and all businesses are obviously reviewing their cost structure right now rightly so um, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, a customer feedback program that's implemented well and working well will pay for itself many times over. This shouldn't be considered a cost in the business. It's an investment to the business. I know that sounds very salesy, and I do apologize, but it's the reality. There's a reason that the big companies all have these programs in place, enormous value to it. Uh, I've mentioned... You know, the ROI in terms of customer recovery, the ROI in terms of improving online reputation through reviews, et cetera. Um, uh, I completely understand if you're a restaurant and you've closed and you don't have any customers, you've got to review those costs and turn the service off maybe. But for a lot of businesses where we need to carry on and try and keep business as usual for our customers, it's even more critical that we keep our customer experience programs going because when we get through the other end of this, we're all going to be scrabbling for our customers and building our business again. And it's really important that we've got a foot up through understanding what you know our customers feel about us. Yes, thank you very much. Great question, Mitchell. Thanks for that. Now, that does bring us to the end of the show today because we've hit the time limit. Thank you very much for your insights today. Terry, Terry, Terry Wiley from Jago, thanks for being with us. Absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys.
Yes, I'm sure everybody has gotten heaps in terms of insights as well. And of course, before you go, we'll be redirecting you to a survey page. Uh, we practice what we preach here, of course. So please- A survey, of course. Yeah, it's fancy that. Please be so kind as to give us your <laughs> thoughts and comments on your way out. We'd love to hear from you. Don't be afraid, give us your feedback. And of course, thank you once again for joining us today from across this beautiful country of ours. Please, wherever you are, stay safe, look after everybody. And we'll catch you on the next episode of the Redback Business Skills Show. And until then, it's goodbye from now.